let's see. Is anybody hearing me? Ah, there we go. Hello, everybody. KB, Cable A. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat on my phone. I, I don't think they can hear me because I'm on. Uh, can you see me? Okay, I guess we're live. Anton, how are you from Denmark, guys? Welcome to the live stream. Today, we wanted to put together a little something, answer some Q&A questions for you. Uh, we are here in the... Oh, no, we better mute that. All right. No problem. All right, I can see myself here. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream. So go ahead and throw your questions in the chat. Uh, if I don't see it or if you skip past it, uh, you can... Put your question in there again. Uh, also, Super Chat certainly gets you up to the top of the list um, and helps me see it because when I'm looking at chat, it's going to uh, show the question. So, um, the awesome. Man, there are people from all over the world. That always just blows my mind to see like people writing in from Brazil, Ireland, England, uh, Canada, um, and my dad just texted me that he can see and hear me. So that's great. Uh, Pops always watching. Um, how are you in the lockdown? Adam, we are doing great. We're keeping six feet apart. We're doing what we can. Um, and we're shipping products daily. We've been able to stay open. Uh, we've had the city of Goleta check us out and make sure that we were an essential business. And we've been able to stay open. So we've been given the all clear. And other than that, I've been staying home and only hanging out with my daughter. Uh, which has been amazing. She's about to turn a year old and just some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. So um, what would be the most? Man, these chats are going fast. Um, Gnomo's Whiskey Spring, super chat, big thumbs up. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate that. Sound is a little low, hard to hear. I, how's sound, everybody? Hold on, Mark. Let's make sure that everything's, uh, let's see if anybody else is having the problem. Maybe that guy just needs to turn up his volume. Um, hi from Ventura, California. Welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, Indiana, Maine. Um, I have a 12 by 20 shop and I'm considering not using a chop saw. Get rid of your chop saw. Uh, I have one. I only use it for rough lumber or bringing lumber into the shop, which is very rare. I build a good crosscut sled with a cat's Moses stop block for your table saw and you're going to be stoked. Uh, I think that makes a massive difference. The only time you would really need a chop saw if you're doing big, big, thick stuff like more than 4x4 four four lumber because a table saw blade usually on a 10-inch table saw only goes about 2 and 7 eighths, roughly. Um, when are you going to make the stool from Tamar? Tim, uh, soon. Uh, it's on the list. I mean, you guys got to understand our list is long. We have so many videos we're trying to get to, and we're doing our best. Uh, I add things to the list all the time. We have a meeting every Monday and discuss the list and what should be next, and we try and kind of keep themes going and weave little threads of a story and and as we grow the channel i think that uh it's interesting what pops up and sometimes i just kind of am driving to work drinking my coffee and i uh text mark i say oh my god get it to work we're doing this today and then that happens so there's not always a rhyme or a reason how or what order we do it in uh leonardo uh it's a touch quiet okay um Oh, uh, no, it's just Leonardo's having a problem. <laughs> I don't know. Um, hey, Dad, if you're listening still, can you text me and tell me how the volume is? Um, sound and video very clear. Okay, so we're good. Yeah, Leonardo, turn up your hearing aids, bud. Um, yes, Adam, we are shipping products daily. In fact, Tamar just released a video with the stop lock, and we have shipped out a lot of stop locks this week. It's really just humbling and amazing to do. Um when I rip completely square board about 1.5 inches wide down the middle on a table saw, do both pieces bow? How can I prevent? That's going to happen. I mean, you got a tree that's been sitting around for, uh, you know, months, years drying out, and there's more moisture in the middle. So sometimes you get a board with a lot of tension in it, and you rip it down the middle, and it's going to bow, and you're going to need to reflatten it. So sometimes you need to think about that, like 
if you have a big massive board especially eight quarter and you're trying to get a final size piece maybe it's good to do it in two steps and reflatten it on the jointer um sometimes what i'll do <laughs> my dad is uh an a-hole uh who thinks he's pretty funny um the the uh, uh so when you're ripping it down the middle sometimes what i'll do especially if it starts to pinch your saw is turn off your saw back it up and then just make that same cut again and you may get rid of the the bow just by trimming off what's moved in towards your kerf uh but moving lumber is a problem uh and it just happens and sometimes you need to plan ahead for that and know that big thick pieces might move after you cut them so sometimes it helps to mill stuff twice so um uh how can you dimension a board in half lengthwise without a bandsaw uh lengthways with, without a bandsaw I mean, there's lots of ways, right? I mean, you, you just need to use the tools that you have. So you could use a skill saw and rip it down the middle. Uh, you could use a jigsaw. You could use a hand saw. Um, obviously, a table saw. Unless uh, you're probably talking about resawing. Okay, I get what you're saying. So here's my trick on big boards without a bandsaw. Is I take my table saw and taking maybe three-quarter inch to one inch passes at a time, if you have a powerful table saw, maybe less, take half an inch. Um, I'll run it against my fence, maybe with an auxiliary tall fence on it rip it flip it over raise the blade a little bit flip it over raise the blade a little bit flip it over don't go all the way through the center and you can uh uh all right dad that's good enough you're distracting me uh, then you can use a hand saw to rip that last little bit or on your last pass you can get so close that you can basically just kind of wiggle it a little bit and that last little bit will come off run it through the planer and get it through um uh, thanks, Ian. I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, pine is way harder to cut dovetails of wood. If you guys are learning dovetails, stop trying to use softwood. You're, you're wasting your time learning because it's just, it's harder. Um, hardwood is easier to chisel. It cuts clean. Pine rips out. It compresses. It smashes. Uh, so if you want to make your learning curve easier, start with walnut uh, or cherry. And I know it's a little bit more expensive, but hey, Screwing up 10 pine boards is a lot better than screwing up two walnut ones. I mean, yeah, price is about the same. But the learning curve and the frustration goes way down, and I think that's worth a lot. Uh, dad was Katz, yes. Uh, dad is Katz. Mom is Moses, still married. Uh, my mom kept her last name, hyphenated it for me. Uh, so that's how I got the last, the last name. Uh, awesome, Jamie. Uh, those blast gates are amazing. We use them. The, the, if you look at my six-inch ones... Uh, I put colored paracord in them. That was the best addition because now I can look from anywhere in, sh in my shop and see that the blast gates are open or closed. I don't have to like walk around and try and get a better angle on it. I can just easily see. In fact, I can see my center columns open. Nothing else is and we're good to go. Well, what up, Danny? Um, do you ship to Denmark? I do. Uh, we There have been a couple countries that have been shut down by our government uh, for shipping. I think that's Israel and Alex. What other countries are shut down besides Israel that we can't ship to? Estonia, Israel and Estonia. So, uh, uh, does resawing a board mean there's a chance it'll warp due to the fact that it was dried double the thickness? Absolutely, it's going to warp. Um, I think in the video about resawing with Wobi Design, it was about five or six videos ago. By the way, Ben Wobi, if you don't, if you haven't checked out his channel, go check it out. Ben Paik is the man. He is so fun to hang out with, and a lot of fun uh, when you resaw. Same thing as I was talking about later about earlier about ripping a board is you have more moisture in the center than you do on the outside So when you rip that it's gonna go like this and so you need to plan ahead for that You need to know that you're gonna be able to have to flatten that middle um, And that's just part of woodworking. So uh, when you resaw a board uh, Think about that and how you're gonna deal with that and mitigate that because if you think that you have a one-inch board then you're gonna be able to use a really thin blade and resaw it to get two half-inch boards it just ain't going to happen. So you're going to end up with two three-eighths inch boards because you're going to need to plane those down and get them flat again. So uh, do you use any Brazilian wood? I'm, I don't know off the top of my head if I have. Name some. Uh, maybe I have. I don't always know the the uh, genealogy report on my wood. Um, what joint are you most proud of? Oh, God, that one. The uh, one with the mitered dovetails, the one that everyone talks so much smack about on the video about it not being strong. Uh, that one was so cool. Uh, and then maybe the Helm's Tooth Dovetails. Uh, that was, that one's just strikingly beautiful, and it's so big. Uh, and it was hard, too, because to get in those back corners, 
on that like double dovetail it cut off my chisel so i had to find some really interesting ways to get back in there that was fun that was a hard one my stanley chisel is 30 degrees new is best change of 25 and a 30 degree just sharpen it guys don't beat yourself up just keep at the same angle uh when it comes to sharpening there's so much i i've done tons of sharpening videos and i think i always say in them like hey there's lots and lots of people out there telling you you have to do this you have to do that if you, if you can cut sliced paper with it, then it's good for woodworking. And the biggest thing is consistency in a flat back. You got to make sure that back is flat. And then, you know, 25 to 30 degrees, as long as it's sharp, go after it and start working on some wood and stop worrying about your chisel. Start wor Stop worrying about your sharpening. Uh, do I plan on doing any resin pour projects? Not if I can help it. Uh, advice for new woodworkers, only buy the tools you need. Everybody gets stuck on the, hey, I've got... I get these emails all the time. Hey, I've got an extra 700 bucks. Should I get this, this, and this? Or should I get this, this, and this? And my question is, what are you going to use those for? And they're like, well, I might want to do some of this. Or I might want to do some of that. It's like, look, I'm going to build a bench. I need a, you know, a set of chisels for mortising. I need a router. Um, do you have those tools? If not, go buy them. And then sell the bench and pay for those tools and keep your hobby going. Uh, but don't beat yourself up somebody wrote me about a 400 dollars ink or crosscut sled the other day and i'm like come on man just build one out of like ten dollars of plywood and put a cat's moses stop lock on it in the cat's moses store uh and and you got the same thing and you can make eight of them that do different things 45 degree crosscut picture frame uh dado sled all of those things um what router guide bushings fit in your dewalt 618 router i i don't know uh, there's lots of them out there. I'm sure you could Google that. Um, Purple Heart, I've, yes, I've used that. Mirsha uh, Karacha, I don't know if I've used that one, at least not by that name. I certainly can't pronounce it. Um, why do you use a Japanese pull saw to cut dovetails instead of a pistol grip saw? That is a great question. Let me tell you. Um, I'll give you a, a really good example here. So uh, here's a old Suizan saw that is pretty much just decoration at this point but this saw and this saw you can see, I don't know if you can see on the video but this one is three times thinner um, and when you cut on the push stroke your saw has a tendency to bind in the cut and now when you get good with a, a western saw it's going to cut faster but these saws are a fourth of the price uh, we sell them actually in my store um, and when you pull, there's no binding because you're pulling it through the cut. When you push, look at it. It, it has a tendency to bend and bind up. Uh, so there's so much easier to work with. And I know a lot of you guys are learning. And it's like you spend 150 bucks on a good Western saw and be frustrated and they're hard. And you, the, the cutting motion is hard. And with one of these, you just kind of drag it through. You can kind of have a very loose grip and let the saw do the work. Makes your life a whole hell of a lot easier. Um, Mark, let me know if I miss anything important, okay? Uh, any strategies for growing a new to you, a newish YouTube channel other than keep at it? I know it takes time. Just wondering if there's a good way to kick things forward. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the same thing everyone tells you, which is I, I did this for five years before I made a dollar and you just have to love it and you got to want to teach and just know that, uh, if you really, really care about it and you really do it for the love of teaching and woodworking that one day it might pay off and, you just got to keep trucking, man. Just share it, share it, share it, and make good content. Um, if you produce a good video, YouTube is going to recommend it. If people like it. They know, the AI knows the viewer's habits. And if some dude who never clicks thumbs up and never comments suddenly goes ballistic and and does all of those things and shares the video on his Facebook, the AI knows that. And it's going to go, oh my gosh, this must be a good video. We're going to share it. So just keep working on making good content and know that nobody's going to watch your stuff in the beginning. So be bad at it. And then you'll get better. And uh, that's how you do it. Just love what you do and don't do it for the money. And then one day you'll get paid for it. Uh, I know it's a cliche answer, but it's really the truth, especially in this crowded marketplace. Um, in a hobby level garage shop with mostly entry job site level tools, would a three quarter horsepower, or one horsepower dust collector be sufficient going from tool to tool when I don't have the amps for a two horsepower dust collector? Uh, certainly, uh, a dust collector is much better than no dust collector for sure. Um, until you're able to run some electrical, you may be able to get some cheap shop vacs and hook them up to each tool. Um, uh, and that kind of thing. You just want to make sure you clean the filters regularly. Otherwise they're not going to perform very well. Um, 
How do you determine the lengths and sides of a dovetail box if there's an inset lid? Any way to calculate the sides? I mean, what size do you want to make your box? It's what's it's like, you know, quarter inch rabbit. Uh, that's one of those questions that it's like, make it the way you want to make it. Um, uh, let's see. Hey, Jonathan, I'm a student living in Europe, and I was wondering why the shipping of your dovetail guides is so expensive. If 10 or uh, what is it, 11 or $12 a Europe is expensive, I don't know what it's cheap because uh, I just charge what I get charged for it, and we do the cheapest shipping in town. So that's, that's a fallacy, Nick. And uh, uh, pricing the stuff you make. Do you go cheap and get your name out there? No. Uh, you... It's if you sell something for 30 bucks, they're going to expect you to make it for 30 next time. Uh, value your work, value your time. And remember that the best way to start a conversation that the problem is, I think people don't pre-qualify their clients. And when someone goes, oh, man, I'd love for you to make this for me. They think, you, oh, this is his hobby. He just loves to do this. He'd love to go out in his garage and whip something up for me real quick. So, yeah, um, maybe we can get together and discuss uh, what design you'd like so I can come up with an appropriate price for that project. And then you never are meeting with people who don't know that it's going to cost money. And I think that, that saves you a lot of time. But, uh, you know, go to fairs, go to craft shows, and uh, share your stuff on your social media. That's how I got started. I just kept sharing everything I did, everything I made on my social media. And very quickly, your friends go, hey, I got a wedding coming up. Can you make me a cutting board? Hey, I loved this tea light candle holder you made. Uh, can you make some for my house? And and that's how you get your name out there is just do, 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 share, share, share. Um, uh, I had the one horsepower uh, dust collector from Harbor Freight. It worked well, even with a two-stage setup. Oh, sorry, that's not a question. Um, just built my first tiny workbench. What are your favorite beginner projects? Uh, cutting boards certainly are a great way to start. Um, Long grain cutting boards are great because you can do lots of designs and you don't spend 16 hours sanding. Uh, candle holders are great because you can get Forstner bits and drill correct size holes for tea lights or candles or whatever it is. Uh, taking a piece of live edge wood and turning it into a napkin holder or, uh, you know, my very first project, the first thing I ever did was I built something to hold my mail. So it was like something you could just stick the bills in when you walked in from the house, walked in from getting the mail. You just throw the bills in there, toss the, the, the uh, junk mail in the trash can and, and that was a great project the but the best beginner projects are ones that are for you because you don't give a crap if they suck you know or if you messed up um and then watch my seven beginner woodworking mistakes video i think there's an important message there uh which is uh don't point out your mistakes uh the day you start woodwork oh wow the laser was actually really loud i don't know if you guys could hear that uh you should do a collaboration video with Matt Esley. That's funny. I, I was talking to him this morning, his dovetail video where he uses my jig, just hit a million views. I was congratulating him. Uh, he's so amazing. Him and I are really good friends. We talk regularly. I love Matt Esley. It might be the first time I've ever publicly said his name right. Um, yeah, Charles, good advice. Uh, don't offer cheap stuff. Um, you cheapen yourself and you cheapen fellow woodworkers. And I think there's a hefty balance between a beginner and an experienced person, but you know, you can make the things you're telling people you're going to make, and they're going to be amazing, especially in the beginning, because you're going to be so freaked out about messing them up. You're going to do a heck of a job. So don't sell yourself short. Uh, then, you know, Karen is telling all her friends that I got this cutting board guy that does them for 30 bucks and she's pissed off and her friends are pissed off when you're not willing to do it for 30 bucks anymore. Um, <laughs> Squatchy's woodworking just puts in the Google question, how to refurbish a Bessemer fence. I don't know. Never done it. Uh, yeah. $10 is not much to Europe. Exactly. Why are you throwing public comments in my chat? Talking smack. Uh, I'm a local woodworker hobbyist. Where do you buy wood in near SB? Oh, awesome. Easy. Mayan hardwood in Oxnard is amazing. Don't go to Woodcraft because Woodcraft buys from Mayan. Mayan's like a candy store for woodworkers. They've got 50 different species from all over the world in different sizes. It's incredible. If you're willing to drive to San Luis Obispo, there's a great place called Aura Hardwoods. Um, and then in Santa Barbara, uh, there's a place called Channel City Lumber. Uh, the owner's name's Troy, really nice locally owned place uh, that has great sheet goods. And then they also have F4S Lumber which is surfaced on four sides. Um, 
they have maple cherry walnut and you know it's more expensive because it's surfaced but when i'm in you know it's a block from my shop so when i'm in a pinch i run down there and grab it and it's awesome and actually right now they've been letting me just go in the yard grab stuff and call them and pay with credit card which is really great for the pandemic um I have the same apron purchased from Amazon, and I just bedazzled, bedazzled myself two square holders out of scrap leather and some leathers. Oh, super easy. Hey, Mark, will you grab the apron sample? So check this out, guys. We just got our second sample in for the Cat's Moses apron. This is the first time you're going to see it right here. Um, I am excited about this. We are getting these things going. Uh, this is uh, – is the other one around too? Is that on the couch? So check it out. This is, is made. Uh, this was our sample. It's got the square holder, which isn't bedazzled, but it fits a square perfectly. Uh, it's got the marking knife holder, which for some freaking reason, they cannot get the size right on that. So we're, we're working on that. Uh, and then it has the logo right here, which I'll show you right now. It's so exciting. This is like, of uh, all the things I've done, this one's really exciting for me for some reason. So this is a non, oh, there's my square. I was looking for that square. I must <laughs> put it in the apron but it's got the logo on the pocket it's gonna have the square holder uh they bedazzled the first one um uh, they got the marking knife holder size wrong but that's super exciting uh so that's gonna be really cool that's gonna be out in a few weeks oh um genomo's whiskey spring better to give a high-end client than a lower price uh better to get a high-end client i can't tell if that's a question uh good for a decent beer thank you a touch of add Truly appreciate it. Uh, Nomingo's Whiskey Spring. Better to give a high-end client than a lower price. I think you're saying, is it better to get a high-end client than give a lower price? I, I think, here's the thing, guys. Mike Farrington did a uh, made-for-profit interview where he laid out the blueprint to making a woodworking business work. Here's what you need to understand. Custom furniture comes with trust. $10,000 piece of furniture comes with trust. You need to build that trust. Sometimes you get that by doing base and case. Sometimes you do that by putting in doors. Um, you know, do the do the the finished carpenter, you know, window framing stuff to get in with a high-end client. And once they see your work and go, wow, you do amazing work, you say, you know, I also do custom uh, uh, furniture and I'd love to build you a heirloom piece of furniture for your new home. So there's there's some aspects to this that are, building up trust and building up a business that are tough when you know you're starting out because you can't just go get that seven thousand dollar epoxy river table build right off the start because people don't know that's a lot of money they don't know if you can handle it and so sometimes it helps to build up a portfolio with clients by starting small you know get them all get them with a cutting board and certainly if you see somebody wearing a fancy watch tell them about what you do for a living because you know they may buy a cutting board one day and then a, a credenza the next so uh, it's all about building it up and, and developing that trust with clientele and keeping them happy. Um, uh, made your goo and love it. I just have a suggestion. Way easier to make it in jars sitting in a double boiler than to scoop it out of a big pan after it cools. Certainly, I would never claim to be a guy who thought through his process in the cleanest, most orderly way. Uh, if we did a pan of the camera right now, you'd see my shop looks like a tornado went through it. In fact, we had a meeting this morning where I said, eh, maybe it's time for Jonathan to do a spring cleaning. So uh, that sounds like a great idea. I will add that to the next video. Naughty Burl Works. I'll get in on that. Damn, I'm going to be drunk with all the beers you guys are buying me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, the apron is going to be cheaper than Amazon with the extras on it. So you can buy the same apron. Don't quote me on that. I'm not a thousand percent sure, but we're going to be pretty close to what it's being sold on Amazon for the one that I have. Um, it's the same exact apron. Uh, we're going to be pretty close, if not better than that price. You guys know how I roll. I like to keep it cheap for you guys. So I've been working really hard and that's why it's taken a little while to come out because I've been beating some manufacturers down uh, and giving the old one two. So, um, will you do a left-handed apron? Definitely. That question gets asked a lot. Anybody put it in the chat, Google it for me. What percentage of people in the world are left-handed? We'll do that percentage of left-handed aprons. Uh, Matt, six or eight to one dovetail guide as a first to buy and practice with. Uh, I personally like the eight to one. We were talking about doing hardwoods earlier and using those to learn dovetails because it's just a faster learning curve. Eight to one is great. Um, six to one is the most popular one. It, over time, over four years, it's been 60% six to ones to 40% eight to ones. Uh, I personally like 
the eight to one. That's what I always reach for. Uh, six to one looks really cool. If you want more of a steeper angle, it gives it way more of a dovetail look. So just a matter of, of preference. I don't think that a difference of, what is it? Nine point, it's 9.6 degrees and 7.1 degrees a difference. So it's like two, 2.5 degrees difference. I don't know that really with today's modern glues that that makes that much of a difference, but it certainly makes a visual difference. So, um, uh, can we pre-order? Yes, but I learned my lesson with the stop block. We put the stop block on sale and it took a year to get it produced. And the worst part was all of you lovely people just emailed me every three weeks going, where's my stop block? Where's my stop block? So I've learned my lesson. It will go on pre-sale, but not until we're going into production when I know that it's coming. Uh, so once I place an order with the company that's making them, then I'll put it on pre-sale. And so that way people don't have to wait, you know, six to eight weeks for their apron and not potentially 12 months while I figure out the supply chain in a pandemic world. Um, uh, do you sell Cats Moses goo? I think we might. Um, we've been talking about it and it seems like a no brainer. It's, it's cheaper the more you buy and make. So, you know, I may be able to get it at a price where I just buy a 55 gallon drum of mineral and, uh, you know, 10 tons of, beeswax and bring it in a dump truck and just let it sit out in the sun for two weeks and make itself and we can jar it up and sell it to you guys um <laughs> left-handed people are just undisciplined and want attention so don't waste your aprons on them yeah screw you lefties uh 10 of people are lefties myself included thank you hunter i will make sure that 10 percent of my aprons are left-handed um, it'll be interesting to find out if more woodworkers are left-handed or not that's kind of a cool thing um, uh, favorite woodworking books, man, I don't know how to read. Uh, unfortunately I'd never learned. So, um, as I read questions in the chat, terrible joke. Uh, you know, I've always been internet guy since I started woodworking. I, I kind of got into it, you know, as YouTube was in its extreme infancy and I was able to watch guys like, uh, Mark Spagnuolo from the wood whisperer and stumpy nubs and Jay Bates, uh, all guys who have become my friends later in years, which is just like, it's like being a fanboy in a fanboy world. It's just awesome. It's cool to hang out with those guys and realize that they're shorter than you. I mean, really cool guys. So, um, uh, what tool do you think, uh, do we have 365 people on the stream, Mark? Holy Toledo. That's amazing. I'm like, that makes me blush. I don't know. I don't know what I just did to deserve you guys, but thank you very much. Uh, that's unbelievable. That's a record for us for the live stream. Sorry. Um, do you prefer to fix up old tools or buy new? Buy once, cry once. I mean, if you like restoring tools and that is a passion of yours, then go for it. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, some things, the bigger they are, the easier it is to buy old ones. Like I've got the 15 horse planer, the 24 inch spiral head. It's like, that thing's built for 300 years. I don't have to do anything to that thing. I get it, clean it up, wipe a little rust off, it's ready to go. But, you know, do I want to restore a four, five, six, and seven Stanley hand plane and, you know, try and resharpen stuff and clean it up for hours? That's just not my thing. Uh, so I, I like buy once, cry once, but sometimes when you're getting into it, it you can pick up an old rusty thingamajigger uh, and get it going, and it helps you imp improve your woodworking, which is awesome. So I'm into that. Uh do you think it's still possible to have a successful woodworking business without YouTube? Certainly. Um, I have several friends locally here in town who have very successful woodworking businesses. Uh, Keith Ryder Furniture is a local guy who d doesn't even know how to work a computer. Uh, and he crushes. Um, I, I think it is certainly possible. However, like I was saying earlier, the way that I got clients when I started is I just shared it on social media to my friends. So maybe not, uh, you don't need to start a woodworking channel, but certainly an Instagram is very important. Um, it's, it lets your friends know that this is what you do for a living. I mean, it's like, you know, if you're a plumber, but you don't tell anybody that you uh, can run irrigation, they're never going to ask you to do it and you're never going to make any money. So you need to let people know. And social media, which is the reason I got into YouTube when I invented the jig, is the cheapest form of advertising because it's free and so you have the ability to share beautiful things with your friends and family and then they tell their friends and family and suddenly you have a big local following but anybody who gets into this and thinks they're going to be rich off woodworking in six months it just ain't going to happen you need to work hard and you need to put your dues in and and uh, build a business but one thing i really highly suggest 
is broaden your horizons as a finisher, finish carpenter. Mike Farrington, I said it earlier in this live stream, if you're just tuning in, he did a made-for-profit interview with John Malecki and Brad Rodriguez where he laid out the blueprint. He, Mike Mike uh, Farrington has one of the most successful woodworking businesses I've ever seen, and he didn't even start doing YouTube till like a year or two ago. Uh, he's been doing it for 20 years. And what he does is he broadens his horizons. He does base and case. He does window framing. He puts in doors. Uh, and then he develops a trust with those clientele, and they give him they give him big furniture projects. And, you know, for every $10,000 armoire he does, he does, you know, 400 windows, which are – he charges the same rate for hourly. Uh, but there's way more windows and doors going in than armoires being built. So it's, it's important to broaden your horizons and, and – don't be a snob about, I don't leave my shop, you know, and I only work for $85 an hour. It's like, hey, I'm happy to come out and put in some baseboards because I'm going to do it better than any of these finished carpenters that are on your framing crew. Um, so it's a great way to build a robust, well-rounded business. Uh, uh, selling your soul, I must have missed something in the price. How do you price their pieces? Is a certain percentage about cost or material? Best way to learn about this is listen to the Mike Farrington Made for Profit. I know they're going to see a big spike in views, but if you're serious about growing a woodworking business, go listen to that. Mike Farrington is the smartest guy I've ever met in this business, So, uh, and he's a very close friend of mine. We talk regularly. I highly recommend everything he does. Uh, as far as pricing your work goes, um, you're never going to get what you really spent time on, so... What I do is I take my materials. Uh, I add 20% to that because you know it's going to happen. Uh, and then I figure out how many hours I think it's going to take and I double it. And then, you know, that's my price. So uh, you learn as you go and you like you realize that something that, you know, after you've done a few end grain cutting boards, you realize, you know, there's a lot of sanding involved and you spend a few hours doing that. Uh, so maybe it's not a $50 piece anymore. It's got to be a $250 piece. And you start to realize that and you start to build up a uh, business where, you get a better understanding of your pricing. Uh, one of the things Mike talks about in that interview is how he keeps track of everything and how he aggregates it and has a, an Excel sheet that's like, okay, well, I've done this task before and it took me three hours, so I can put that in the Excel sheet and search it and be able to create bids for that. Um, Left-handed people are typically smarter and we woodworkers in taking sharp saws, putting them into obscenely powerful motors then jam wood at them. Probably not a large contention of lefties. <laughs> Uh, your thoughts on Rob Cosman? I mean, what do you want me to do? Bash the guy on the live stream? Um, I've never met him. He seems like an awesome guy, and he's a phenomenal teacher. He runs that great charity. I got lots of respect and love for Rob Cosman. But I, what did you think I was going to say, Joey? Like, oh, screw that guy. <laughs> now someone's going to edit that together. And uh, uh, Robert, so it'll take nine months to get rich doing woodworking. Correct. Uh, idea on what track with measure that will work with your stop block oh james did you send me an email like six of them about uh measuring tape on the thing just put a measuring tape on it you can measure to the edge of the stop block um there's a, i just works with t-track i know there's t-track with tape in it and stuff like that i'm sure you can get it and if that wasn't you i'm sorry james uh i just i feel like i've gotten that question like eight times this week um what size straight router bit do you like to use for an inch and a half dado groove or larger God, if I'm going to do that, I'll probably do it on my table saw with a dado stack. Uh, but if I'm going to do that, I mean, you got to take a bunch of bites on that. Uh, you wouldn't want to use like a three-quarter inch bit. That would be just insanity, especially if you're going at any depth. Uh, but I might use like a half-inch bit and maybe very, you know, knock out a lot of the middle and then very carefully do my edges. Um, and then maybe like clean it up. But certainly don't try and take that all at once. That would be... It would be a good, sounds like a good way to get your router to jump all over the place. Um, do you have a link for that interview with Mike Farrington? I do not. But Made for Profit podcast with John Malecki and Brad Rodriguez. Tell him I sent you Mike Farrington episode. It was a few episodes ago. I don't know, like 10 or something. Um, all right, James, sorry. I, uh, I, I don't know why I got an attitude there all of a sudden. Uh, and Joey, I was just teasing. Uh, I love Rob Cosman. He's, he's a really good teacher. Um, it seems to be people who really like him always like to bash me for using a dovetail jig. Um, I've actually talked to Rob Cosby on the phone uh, when, oh God, I can't even tell that story. But uh, we had a conversation about uh, a business matter and he gave me some, actually some really good advice. So um, uh, I'm playing some walnut 
as I'm listening to this and wanted to know if anyone out there liked the yellowish parts of walnut. It's called the sapwood, uh, and it's certainly used. So walnut, if you go to my website, I got a ton of slabs, and you can see that there are very few big pieces of walnut. Walnut is a very slow-growing tree, and it grows very small, and uh, it uh, you get that sapwood, which is the wood that is brand new on the edges that slowly turns to that walnut color as you as you move on. Uh, and it's certainly used, and with walnut, it's almost unavoidable if you want to get big pieces, uh, especially if you're doing big panels or anything, because it's just walnut so small that you got to get some sapwood in there to get a full-size panel. So um, link for the podcast. Hey, Mark, will you throw that link in the chat for Mike Farrington, Made for Profit? If you need help finding it, let me know. Um, how would you cope without your table saw? I don't know. I would quit woodworking. <laughs> Uh, table saw is like the most useful tool in the shop. You use it every project all the time. Um, and there's, I mean, my first table saw was a, uh, $75 refurbished Ryobi table saw. And it, um, I got a ton of great projects done on that and it worked. And I just built it in, I built a little table that it slid into. So that kept it from tipping over and I got tons of stuff done with it. So, uh, you can get a table saw. I highly recommend it. You can pick them up for 100 200 bucks on Craigslist. Um, watch my tool shopping tips video. I think that's really helpful about negotiating. Um, and when you're negotiating tools, remember, there's not a lot of woodworkers in your area. And so, you know, that person that wants money now for a machine that very few people are in the market for, they're going to probably take a lot less than they list it for. So hold your ground and always be willing to walk away from a deal and you're going to get what you want. Um... What do you think of Joey? I know. Sorry. I came off like such a jerk there. I, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Joey. I didn't mean it. Message redacted. Why? What'd you say, Hunter? Um, uh, so I'm not on my, um, uh, page. So I guess I'm getting mine censored. Um, uh, Michael McKinnon asks, I'm building some exterior tables for a restaurant. Do you think an epoxy and, Spar urethane finish is the most durable. Uh, what would you do for finish? Uh, there's a tabletop epoxy from Total Book that's great. Uh, the problem that you'll find with any epoxy finish, any spar, you know, very long time dry finish, is that, man, you get, it's just never going to be perfect. You're going to get little dust fragments in there. There'll be, you know, little undulations. But if the restaurant is looking for that big thing, thick look then the tabletop epoxy is great it's self-leveling it dries crystal clear um but there's there's nothing wrong with doing like a polyurethane uh water-based finish uh and just do you know three or four coats um if they're going to sit outside certainly do a spar urethane do your research make sure you use an exterior coating because man the sun sun and water are mean mistresses they just they go after anything that they touch so um uh Christopher Schwartz recommends an 18 TPI coping saw for dovetails. Someone must have asked about coping saws. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what I use. I just kind of throw one in there and get it done. Um, but the there's a, a supply and demand curve between uh, very small with lots of teeth and cuts fast with less teeth. So you kind of want to – 19 sounds right, 16, 18, something like that. Um Oh, uh, Hunter, I just repeated questions I wanted heard. Wasn't swearing anything. Just deleted my comment afterwards, so it wasn't flooding the feed. Gotcha. Uh, ask your question again. Uh, oh, and I just posted. Thanks, Mark. It's so weird to see my own name in the chat. Uh, there's the Made for Profit uh, podcast. Uh, we just posted a leak, link. Cody, serious question. What projects do you recommend for somebody who wanted to go from beginner stuff to more intermediate projects? I've been practicing making boxes for a minute. Want to level up. It's time to build your first piece of furniture, Cody. Uh, boxes are great. That's how I got started. It's probably my favorite thing to do because it's super intricate. And, you know, you'll find if you were getting good at making boxes that furniture is going to be uh, a no-brainer for you. It's just a little bit bigger scale. Um, you know, uh, desks are great. Um, you can make a hall, entry table, coffee table. Lots of people make coffee tables. And then, uh, you know, side tables are great, too, for your living room and your bedroom because, um it, they're a little bit smaller, so the wood's not as heavy. I think one of the hardest parts about being a beginner and having kind of smaller tools is if you try and 
muscle some eight quarter lumber through your table saw it's going to be frustrating and so uh you can uh, uh get frustrated and turned off if you tackle something that's too big right away until you start to learn how to deal with like bigger and bigger stuff um and figure out different ways to manage your materials um uh how do you feel about pocket screws they have their place i mean Man, I'm not a hater of anything, uh, except maybe Joey. I'm Joey, I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> Joey, uh, where did you start selling your products? Etsy, craft fairs, et cetera. Like I said, um, the, the trick is just share it on your social media, get your friends and family involved in loving your stuff, and they're going to start telling their friends and family, and then look for craft shows. Uh, look for places to uh, that uh, will take your stuff on consignment. There's lots of stores that will just let you put their furniture in there. They take a cut like 10, 20%. Um, and you can look for those things, but really the trick is share it on your social media, get your friends and family knowing what you're doing and, uh, they're going to share it with their friends and family. And, and, you know, then suddenly I, I constantly now I, I have my local friends reach out and ask me to make commission work. And of course I don't do commission works anymore. Um, so, you know, it just builds up over time. People know you're a furniture builder and they start asking for cornhole boards. And, oh, that's a good pro beginner project. Cornhole boards are awesome. Um, cornhole boards, um, chess boards, cutting boards. Uh, I'm trying to think of other things I've sold. Boxes, urns, um, you know, lots of different stuff that you can create for people. Um, what would be the best way to finish ochre maple with dark black stain? Don't stain hardwood. Don't do it. If your client wants hardwood stain, convince them to get the wood that matches their stain. It's a waste of hardwood, and it, it, uh, in my personal opinion, it just really, it's, it's a beginner mistake. I get those emails, panicked emails and Instagram messages like, help, the stain doesn't match the can. Like, the client, the client wanted this. What do I do? It's like, you know, the, the best way to convince your client is, look, you are going to spend just as much money paying me to stain and finish this as you are to just get the wood you want. So let's find the wood you want. We'll throw some, you know, just wipe some uh, shellac on it so they can see what it's going to look like once it's dry. It's just so much prettier. Um, saw your infinity cube table is about to start one myself. What would you say the biggest hangup is on the build? That thing's hard. Um, you know, you watch the video. I talk a lot about getting stuff to line up. Uh, the biggest mistake I think I made is I didn't worry about it being plumb. Uh, so I sort of clamped it up and made sure everything was square, but I should have maybe clamped it on a flat surface, maybe put some parchment paper down and, uh, clamped it on a flat table or something like a workbench. Something I knew was flat. How do you manage to keep your hair looking so sharp during lockdown with all the barbers being closed? Uh, I cut it myself. Actually, that's not true. Um, my friend, uh, cuts it. So that's my one, my one, uh, social distancing, uh, faux pas, um, he does hate something. <laughs> uh, staining curly maple is okay. No, Michael, don't do it. Uh, how do you come up with your own designs and products? What is your process? Uh, it, it, uh, I, I, they say what? Necessity is the mother of all invention. So I find something that pisses me off or makes me frustrated. And I go, I know I can do this better. And then I start looking into ways to do that. I start thinking about it. We start doing designs. I got, you know, over the years of building products, I've developed kind of a, some good relationships with some engineers who are friends and beer, you know, uh, beer drinking buddies of mine. So I'll bounce ideas off them and, and then we'll start to refine it and we design it in fusion. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll design uh, a prototype on the 3d printer and go from there. But really the, the thing is, if you, if you have a good idea, you're going to know it and uh, you want to start seeing if people will use it and you start building prototypes, just build them out of wood or aluminum. Uh, if you have access to like a milling machine and start getting people to test it and then start selling it and start putting it out there. And eventually those prototypes selling prototypes will fund a production run and then that'll fund a bigger production run, which gets the price down and uh, then you do it. And so you, that's a scary game guys uh, because you got to take some really big risks. You know, stop block was the scariest thing I ever did. I had to put $80,000 into that before I sold them um, to be able to get that price to a reasonable level. And I had to borrow big and, and steal to get that 
paid the I had to get a loan. The manufacturer let me pay in six payments. And I was just like, man, I hope these sell because otherwise I'm not going to make that second payment. And uh, luckily it turned out to be a hit and uh, we've been doing well with it. So um, uh, what is the best lesson you've learned by a mistake? Doesn't have to be wood related. Uh, gosh, uh, be kind to people and it's okay to be wrong. And it's, it's important to say sorry when you are. Uh, I think that, you know, this week, uh, here's a personal story. I, my brothers, I'm very, very close with my family. And I told my brother that he was asking me an annoying question and we were having a pretty serious talk. Um, and what I meant by that was, um, I'm frustrated cause I don't know the answer to your question and I don't know how to have the information to give you a proper answer. And instead, I kind of insulted him instead of saying, you know what, I don't know. Uh, maybe you can help me find the answer. And so we have a meeting this weekend, and I intend to apologize to him because I was in the wrong. And I could tell it kind of hurt his feelings, and we're very, very, very close. Um, and I wish I hadn't said it that way, but I was frustrated in the moment. And so I lashed out, and uh, I certainly owe him an apology. So I think that's a big one is, is apologize when you're wrong. Don't just say, okay, well, I'll just – whatever. They know I was just – angry or they know that I was I'm an emotional tell it like it is person don't be that guy apologize when you're wrong um let's see what else we got sorry that was that uh, we got deep here um <laughs> I was wrong about being wrong once but I apologize for it uh that's what I always say uh oh that's the first time I've ever been wrong or I'm the smartest guy I know <laughs> uh what jigs should I make by to help with getting accurate angles and measurements when cutting an assembly, etc. Sleds are awesome. Build sleds and build sleds and build sleds. They're quick. They're easy. And, you know, you can just make them out of scrap wood and do like the sled I built that just runs on one runner. It's a pretty easy one to get done. And you can build them for each project. I got like 10 sitting behind me. Uh, and they really help with angles and repeatability. I mean, it's I think it's really hard to get weird angles. Um, you know, anything that's not 90 or 45 is not always easiest with a lot of tools. So, uh, a quick little jig. It doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to work. So, um, I made your coffee siphon pot as a project for school. Nathan, if you haven't sent me a picture, please do that. I, guys, I love when you build stuff that I make. So please send me pictures. I love that stuff. Uh, Jonathan, do you know what the delay is for filling your orders right now? Um, uh, we had a small, uh, supply chain, uh, Problem last week uh, where some magnets took a little bit longer to come in, but we're, we're back on top. So um, I sent out an update email this morning. We'll, we'll be caught up by tomorrow. Um, other than that, we're shipping daily. So uh, be kind to Joey. <laughs> Poor Joey. Joey, send me an email. Uh, I'll send you a stop block and a jig. I was a jerk, and I was teasing. So um, <laughs> being nice to Joey is the exception that proves the rule. Joey, are you still in the chat? I hope you are. Cause that was fun. Um, uh, graduating from basic tools to higher end ones, such as planers and jointers, any suggestion on what elevates your woodworking from hobbyist to being more professional table saw planer. Uh, that'll get you 90% of the way there. Uh, from there, uh, I mean, even just looking around my shop, other tools that are really helpful are drill press, of course. Um, and a jointer certainly, but there's lots of ways to make the jointer your last big tool. Uh, I would do it in this order. Table saw, planer, bandsaw, uh, jointer. And then drill press is kind of one of those things that if you're careful with a drill, you can get it done. Uh, and a drill press is definitely helpful and makes it easier, but nothing you can't get done with a drill. So um, <laughs> William Walker should definitely apologize. There you go. I hate that guy. Uh, actually, Will and I are good friends, and usually when we talk bad about each other, we know it's coming. Um, uh, tips on getting more followers on IG. You know, I just, that's not my department. I, I think you should have fun, and uh, uh, people will see your absolute enjoyment and love for what you're doing, and they will want to follow you. Um, I don't think you should put, in fact, I gave a huge talk uh, this year at WorkbenchCon about this thing is, don't care. You just shouldn't care about the number. You should care about the loyalty of the ones who do follow you. So if you have a hundred followers that will support and, and, uh, 
support you in anything you do. That's way better than 10,000 that only check out one out of every 30 things you do. Um, why do lines move between measuring and cutting? <laughs> Watch a video I did like two years ago called Superior Accuracy in Woodworking. I spend like 24 minutes just breaking that down for you, how to get super accurate results. Uh, Joey, my guy. Uh, what router bit would you suggest for a freehand curve in three quarter inch plywood? Huh. Sounds really hard to do. Uh, maybe like something with a very small tip and go really, really slow. Uh, or take it to a, like a local machine shop and see if they'll let you rent time on their CNC or they'll do it for you. Uh, I'll take all the rudeness. You've got a stop block out of it. Um, yeah, that no zero days, that was fun to do. I was glad I got to share that story. I've been wanting to do that for a long time, and I, I really appreciate all the support I got on that. It really certainly made me feel uh, pretty great to have all that positive feedback from you guys, so I really appreciate that. Um, uh, Jamie Perkins from Perkins Build Brothers had a major joint injury a couple days ago. I'm sorry to hear that. That is Nobody wants to hear that. That's rough. Uh, it, it's... Uh, Oh. Robert Moline says, oh, let's see. Um, well, man, it's a small tip and go slow. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, I'm impressed with your hair. I'll tell you the trick to good hair is uh, what do I use? Uh, I use the crew forming cream and I just like put a little bit on my hand and I just and go to work. I do it like damp. I get out of shower and I, you know, uh, powder my balls and, and uh, put on some deodorant. And then by that time, it's kind of damp and throw some uh, gentlemen. <laughs> and I uh, throw some uh, the forming cream in my hair. Um, the chest table I'm going to be building is cherry with curly maple mahogany board. What would you su suggest as an inlay wood for a triple dovetail? Uh, um, what is it? Maple... Curly maple, mahogany, and cherry. Uh, walnut would be great. Uh, wangi would be great. Uh, both of those are really dark. I'd go for dark woods um, with those. That's going to look the best. Wangi is like black. It's kind of expensive. It's like $25 a board foot. But if you just do an inlay uh, or ebony is pure black. Uh, walnut could be pretty dark. It might kind of clash with the mahogany a little bit. But Sean Boyd just did uh, a chessboard. It's the best one I'd ever seen. He did it right next door to me. Oh, I miss Sean so much. I'm bummed he left, uh, but he's doing really well. So, um, the it, it's like it was so fun to just have a buddy right next door I'd go talk to anytime, and I'd pretend like I I could convince myself it was working talking to Sean because we were brainstorming. But I miss him. Uh, Mark and Alex are great, uh, though they they're good conversationalists as well. But uh, it was fun having another like hardcore woodworker next door to r bounce ideas off and like you know, help you joint a board that was too big and things like that. Um, what bit number of passes path depth do you find works best for CNC for three quarter inch ball tip? I mean, that all depends on your CNC. I've got a 10 by five CNC that could probably cut that stuff in half in one pass. I've got a two by three CNC that I'm selling. If anybody wants to buy my Axiom CNC, by the way, you can come pick it up. Uh, I'll do fucking... Jeez, sorry. Um, <laughs> it was my first slip up on YouTube ever. I'll do, uh, you know, whatever, 60% of whatever the retail cost is. It was like $9,000. Um, so uh, if you're serious, email me with the subject line that says, I want to buy your Axiom. And that price is firm, so don't negotiate with me. Um, wanted to upgrade my table saw fence. Any recommendations? Yeah, there's some good ones. The Bessemeyer fences are awesome. Uh, I forget Mark Spagnola did a video a few years ago. I can't remember what it was, but it, it looked cool. Uh, the, any relation to the woodworker, Gary M. Katz? No. Um, demonetized. I know. Uh, thanks Jeff. Uh, Brad, thank you so much. Uh, Katz Moses goo is good for the hair. It's funny. I'm about to see myself curse on the, the chat monitoring I'm doing. <laughs> That was a that was a mess up, uh, Tim. I 
it's funny. I, I, in my regular life, I, I don't like, I'm not like a, I don't cuss like a sailor, but you know, I cuss, uh, from time to time. And I, I tried so hard not to let it slip when we were shooting video that eventually it became a habit. Same as, um, like if you go back and watch my old videos, there's like tons of like cuts while I'm talking. Cause I go, uh, 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 and, uh, then it just became just a habit. And instead of saying, uh, I like, we'll just take it. You, you take a pause, you know, and you think about it and you go and you just cut it out. Cause the, uhs just to me, when I was editing video before Mark came on and took over that, it was the, the uhs would drive me nuts. You could see them coming in the audio waveform. They look like this. That's an, uh, I mean, I could, it still like haunts me. So yeah, I don't know what people are asking about buying big tools, but buy once, cry once, buy once, cry once, guys. Don't, I've replaced every tool in my shop. And if I just waited a couple months when I bought them in the first place, you get all excited and you're super into it. It's like, just wait. Just, I know you're excited, but give yourself two months and you'll save thousands of dollars. I've replaced everything. I, my first, if I look back at my first two years of woodworking, there is one tool that I can see where I'm sitting that I still have that's in my shop now. And it's just like, just buy once, cry once, try, try to save a little bit more, you know, get a little bit better. Even if it's like, you know, waiting one more paycheck and adding a hundred bucks to your budget, you know, try and do it. Um, uh, <laughs> the reason it's not negotiable and certainly you're welcome to try, but I'm a bastard when it comes to negotiating, uh, is, uh, 60%. It, I'll give it to you for 60% of retail. That's like these things go up in value. So, um, it's not worth my time for less than that. That's why I said, don't try and negotiate with me because I don't care. It could sit there for another two years. Uh, but, um, it's not going to. It's not going to be used much anymore. So, uh, can we get a buy once, cry once sticker for our expensive tools? Yeah. And, uh, maybe you need a sticker. that's like, uh, this is why I have to sleep in the shop tonight. Uh, it's cause this came home. Um, fusion 360 is what software I use. Uh, did you go through more than one table saw upgraded? Did you jump straight from the Ryobi? That was one I was smart on. Uh, I no, I just jumped straight to the saw stop. I knew, that anything less than buying a really nice cabinet saw would bum me out and it wasn't worth it. So um, I just waited. I, I'm real patient on tools I need. I, I wait months uh, and just keep shopping and looking and trolling Craigslist, uh, looking and setting up Google alerts and auctions and eBay. And I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll spend five minutes every morning looking to see if there's any new posts in the places I check. And, and that's pretty good. Um, uh, what is the tool you still have? The rigid oscillating belt sander. And I don't know that, I mean, I think there's just nothing else in that price range. And uh, so uh, it gets the job done when I need it. It's it's good for a few things I do from time to time. Um, what else? I guess I still have my drill press that I got early on. And then I'm sure some hand tools behind me. But, you know, for the most part, I've replaced just about everything over time because you just you realize you're like, well, this is great, but it'd be really great if I could do this. And maybe that's just the sickness. Uh, how tall can I make the fence on my crosscut sled for the no deflection stop lock to reach the bottom? Uh, it's on the website. Um, the exact measurements, I think it's 3.75. I think it goes 2.25 to 3.75. There's four positive stops every half inch, maybe something like that. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, awesome. All right, guys, that's an hour. My voice, it, when you got a voice like this, sometimes to talk for an hour, it, it kind of hurts after a while. Uh, years of, of angelic living is how I got this voice. So, uh, I'm sure you can understand I was a good schoolgirl uh, when I was younger. Um, th thank you so much for watching guys. Uh, truly is a pleasure. I, I love these doing these kind of things. So, uh, I'm always humbled by your support and I really appreciate it. And if you want to support the channel, head over to the Cats Moses store, pick up a dovetail jig, stop blocker, t-shirt, stay safe in the shop. Have a wonderful day, guys.